What's up, guys? Welcome to our new show, The Better Broken Podcast. In this show, we're going to be interviewing amazing human beings, and we're going to be really talking about the hardships and the struggles that help them get to where they are and how those struggles help them become the people that they are today. Um, this is kind of based on my book that's going to be coming out in 2024, January, called Better Broken. So hope you guys enjoy. Check it out. We'll see you in the episode. What's up, Jay? Yeah, what's going on, man? Thanks for coming, dude. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Uh, this is a long time in the making. <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome. And so we'll start off just talking about uh, you give your spiel on your channel. Let mm -hmm. them know like um, so your your background, your history, yep. where you're from, why you're here. Uh, you're you're really on the come up yeah. in the YouTube and environment and um, social media and all that. And it's yeah. it's really it's cool to see because it's like a lot of people want to do that. Yeah. And a lot of people really push for that, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work out for everybody. Yeah. And I think the if I was just giving my personal opinion on that, it's, it's just about the character yeah. and the desire of the person doing it. Yeah. So you clearly broke through uh, that plane that holds most people back from mm -hmm. doing it. And so that's why you're here today. And that's why we connected is because we're on a very similar trajectory. So let's just hear some of how you got to that point, why you made that decision, and um, then we could touch on your career and stuff like that. Awesome, awesome. Again, man, I appreciate you having me. Um, because when I started this, I think it's uh, you and a and a couple other YouTubers uh, reached out. Because um, again, it's such a different space for me. Uh, you know, being in the military, Green Beret, quiet professional. So when I started this and having you and some of the other guys mentor me, that that meant a lot to me. So for that, I appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, so Jay Dawley is uh, retired Army Green Beret. I just spent 20 years as a Green Beret, retired. Um, from New York City uh, originally, um, joined the military right out of high school, right? Uh, it was one of those things, growing up in a big household, um, couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I know I didn't want to do college. Folks were busy working, uh, trying to provide, so it's like, hey, what do I do? Do I stay in New York City, become like my friends, or do I you know, uh, find something else to do? So with that in mind, I joined the military, uh, signed up as a 12 Bravo combat engineer, uh, did five years at Fort Riley, Kansas as a combat engineer. Um, and then after deploying a couple of times, I was like, hey, it's looking for IEDs, just it's not as fun as some people make it out to be. Got blown up a couple of times and uh, I had to do something different. So I went to selection, uh, got picked up, went through the Q course as a uh, 18 Charlie um, Special Forces Engineer spent 15 years over a third group, um, and then uh, made it all the way up to first sergeant. And then uh, I was staring at, I uh, saw a major, I was at the 20 year mark, and I was at that fork in the road. Like, what do I do? Do I keep pushing forward? You know, both wars have just ended. Um, like, what exactly am I getting out of this? Uh, so I had a decision to make. And I had the family, I took a look at them. I wanted to keep going forward, just to be honest. But as I looked at my young kids, my wife, I realized that was a selfish decision to make, right? Because I literally just spent 20 years running and gunning, and now it's like I get a chance to actually give them my undivided attention. Mm -hmm. um, so with that lurking, I made the decision to retire. Um, and as soon as I made that decision, like I started to fill a void. Like, holy crap, I just spent 20 years um, in the military. As I get, get ready to transition, what am I going to do next? What is that going to look like? What's my purpose? Mm -hmm. What's my identity? Um, and it took me a while to figure that out. Uh, one thing that I love to do and I always knew I wanted to do was to help individuals, right? As a leader in the military, I pride myself in helping my soldiers uh, getting to where they wanted to be. So me transitioning, I had to find something else that would fill that specific void. Uh, so I did some research uh, and to be honest with you, man, like the one of the first channels that I saw was yours and Kirk. And initially I was like, man, who the fuck are these dudes? <laughs> right. Because leading up to that point, like being a special forces guy, being a Green Beret, like we're not on social media mm -hmm. like that. Right. You get the quiet professional mantra beat into you to where like you submitted, like you're done. You don't even want to deal with any of that stuff. So um, when I jumped on there the first time, YouTube, I started Googling, hey, Green Berets, SF. And you guys' channel was one of the ones that kept popping up. So I did some research. 
And I'm like, okay, well, these guys are able to help, you know, upcoming Green Berets. They help guys go to selection and help them succeed. Like, maybe I can do something like that, right? So I started to dig into it, and I put a business plan together. I'm like, yep, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to take my 20 years of experience and give it to the next generation. I want to share all that knowledge, all that wisdom with the next group of Green Berets so when they get to a point where they're at war or they're staring at it going to war, they have all that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, they don't have to start from scratch. Right. Uh, and so with that in mind, I started uh, Green Beret Chronicles on YouTube. And for the last year or so, um, I've just been sharing uh, all my wisdom and all my knowledge. And it's given me that void that, you know, that, that I was missing whenever I stepped away from Special Forces. Um, so that's where we are now. Again, again I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give some more out to the folks. Yeah, man, of course. And it feels good to have, first of all, I appreciate you crediting us. Like, mm -hmm. we, you didn't need to do that. You know, that was something that you chose to do because yeah. you're just an open, honest dude. And, yeah. and we appreciated that. Yeah. And then also, at first, it's like, is well, here's competition, yeah. right? And then you feel that, but Kurt's like, no, like, w let's, I found this guy, he's doing what we're doing. Like, let's help and let's, yeah. you know, learn from each other. And mm -hmm. then, so his idea was like, let's help as much as we can, yeah. which is a really you would think is like the the re, the automatic yeah. response, but it's really not in this business. Mm -hmm. So, but once we started that, it felt good for me to feel like we had a community that we are building a community yeah. of people helping the community, yeah. and that felt good. So we're not just alone anymore. It's yeah. like, hey, we could do it together, and then we could reach more people together, mm -hmm. and it's just funner. Yeah. So that's really cool, and I appreciate yeah. that, man. Um, yeah. So let's let's dig in because you you got the YouTube channel. You're you started you know breaking away from uh, being quiet and like mm -hmm. being on social media, which is not easy. No, it's not. People <laughs> think that it's like all fun and yeah. games, but it's really tough. You're yeah. putting yourself out there in a way that you really don't want mm -hmm. to and never intended to, yeah. but it's part of the process, right? But you had some controversy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as we were talking about earlier, so let's yeah. just d j dive right into that. Yeah. So. Um, you want it, You went on and fill me in on a video that you did yeah. talking about the Navy SEALs yeah. and kind of what the backlash from that yeah. was like, and then maybe we could, you know, dig yeah. into that a little more. Uh, so the biggest thing that I pride, like I've always pride myself in being honest, right? Because growing up as a Special Forces guy, like you know the team room is about as a brutal of an environment as any environment could mm -hmm. get. So if you go out and you do something messed up, regardless of how small it is, you're gonna hear about it from your teammates. Mm -hmm. And that's expected because as A-type dudes, like we're there to make each other better. Like if we go out on a mission, even though we're successful, we always come back and we do a uh, after action review, right? It's like, hey, this is what we did right, this is what we did wrong. Yep, the right stuff, we don't really give a shit about because you're expected to do the right stuff. You're expected to execute to a certain level. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that we do wrong, that's what we normally focus on because that's what needs to improve. And I pride myself uh, on my YouTube channel and being very vocal about, hey, going into this, guys, this is what you should expect. Like, you're going to face hardship. Like, guys are going to challenge you. Guys are going to do certain things to you, and you need to be ready for it. Um, and approximately three weeks ago, <laughs> I was sitting back and I started thinking about, you know, the current uh, military spaces for special operations, right? And I realized like, hey, like, there's a lot of quiet professionals across the entire spectrum as it comes, when it comes to SF dudes, MOSOC, uh, Rangers, and everyone else. And the more I looked at it, the more I started to realize like, holy shit, like, when I look at social media, I see a lot of Navy SEALs. Again, nothing against them, it is what it is. But a lot of the things that you see out there that are being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That are being uh, shown to the public, that are being hyped up, whether mm -hmm. it's a movie, a certain operation, um, only the good is being shown, right? And before I put out the video, I premised it with, hey, Thank you for your service. I appreciate all the dudes that were involved uh, in those operations. However, the end state of the operation shouldn't be the only thing that is being uh, publicized, mm. right? They just see the outcome. Like, hey, you know, lone survivor, four dudes went out, they were heroes. 
uh, Old Boy Survive, this is where we're at. Another one was uh, John Chapman, right? Um, that operation. Hey, this is what happened. Uh, the chief got a Medal of Honor. So I talked about those two videos specifically and saying, hey, fog of war, stuff happens. Uh, but if you're going to put that information out to the public, you should tell the entire story. As in, hey, this is what went wrong, right? This is what led to this specific end state. Right? And you, you kind of... In- you had a particular reason for wanting that, mm-hmm. right? It's not just because you wanted to call out the seals yeah. or you wanted to to point at somebody and say, look what you did wrong. It's you had an end goal, yeah. which was to. Yeah. So the end state was to make sure that guys understand that uh, this is not the norm. Right. If you're going to uh, go out there and talk about a certain thing, you need to look at the bad and the good. And I wanted to use it as a. Uh, as a learning point for some of these younger dudes to Mm -hmm. make sure they understand that accountability is a big thing, Mm -hmm. right? You don't just talk about the good. You also have to talk about the bad and understand that this is not normal, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the initial intent behind the video. And as soon as I posted, it just went crazy and I was getting a lot of backlash about, hey, you know, I'm doing this for clicks. I'm bashing Navy SEALs. Why am I talking about another service when I'm not in there? And so the entire point behind the video was missed. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, I just want to create an environment where guys can have legit conversation about, uh, you know, accountability. Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, like this is what led to this operation going south. No one's talking about that. Right. right? And if they are, I haven't seen it on YouTube. But if you're going to put it on YouTube, then you need to cover the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if it is, by all means, somebody let me know where I can find the actual conversation about, hey, this is what led this operation to go south. Or, hey, this is what led to John Chapman being left on the mound, right? Like, you need to paint the entire picture because this generation uh, that we're currently dealing with, they'll take whatever information is being put out there, right? If mm-hmm. they see, hey, this dude was left on a mountain, right, and then old boy got a Medal of Honor for it, they're going to think that's normal. <laughs> when it's not, right? you know, as opposed to somebody in that community saying, hey, this is what happened, right? This is what was done about it, and this is why we are where we are right now. Right. And I personally felt like the young men that are on my channel that are listening to me, they weren't getting that. Right? So I'm like, hey, man, like I'm a public servant. I'm serving these young mm-hmm. men, so I'm going to make sure they get the entire picture, and I'm going to make sure they understand that, hey, that's not fucking right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what I did, uh, but the backlash from you know the seals was ridiculous. It was like I opened my inbox and it was like, you know, thirty to forty emails about, hey, you know, the seals aren't the only ones that leave guys on the objective. What about you guys and Tongo Tongo? And I'm looking at those emails. I'm like, well, the fact that twenty of you guys are getting upset and defending your action goes to show my point. You know that you do think it's fucked up. You just don't like to be called out on it. Mm. You know, and as a type dudes, as special forces operator, like. That's what we're all about, calling each other out and letting each other know when something's fucked up, right? right? So um, after reading a shit ton of comments on my channel, I was like, you know what? It's not worth it, right? I don't want guys fighting in the comment section. I don't want to be, you know, looked at that dude that's, you know, attacking another um, community. So I just took the videos down because the the entire intent was completely missed. Right. Um, but it is what it is. Guys reach out to me. I give them raw feedback. Mm-hmm. Like, hey... I'm not the only one that thinks this. And if you think I am, then look at the comment section, right? That'll give you direct feedback as to what everybody thinks of you. Yeah, and it's interesting, this, this, the YouTube environment is they want you to be, they're watching you to be open as honest as mm-hmm. possible until you're open and honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they want you to, to close your mouth and, mm-hmm. and also you know have a, a level of PC yeah. that paints yeah. over everything that we say, yeah. but also while asking us our opinions yeah. on literally everything. Yeah. And that's, we, as prior operators that are talking on social media, we have a level of, um, we're given a level of notoriety, yeah. you know, from that. And so people but, hold on to what we say, yeah. but at the same time. We also have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. That's how I look at it. It's like, hey, you know, like I'm on YouTube for a purpose. Like I want to, you know, like affect these young men in a positive manner. And the truth is the truth. It is what it is, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to sugarcoat it for these guys because, 
you know, like somebody else might not like what it is. Now, granted, it's my truth, but I can tell you right now where there's one, there's 10, where there's 10, there's 100, where there's 100, there's 1,000. Like, I'm not the only one that that feels that way. I'm mm-hmm. just the only one that's on here vocalizing it mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, the rest of the community, they're busy doing other things. They have other um, aspirations, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I keep going back to like, hey, if it's not true, then why are you guys getting upset? It's one of those things like you... You know, like you hear the truth and you know it's true. So instead of, you know, like if if it wasn't true, you would have just let it go, mm-hmm. right? As opposed to getting upset, you know, finding ways to counteract, so on and so forth. Yeah, reaching right? out and yeah, so saying something about it. So yeah, interesting topic to say the same. Um, yeah. But I, I'm, it's it's fun. It's good to like jump on and, and yeah. hash it out. It's like because I didn't know that there was that controversy. I didn't know that yeah. saying that would lead to such controversy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, the, the reason I don't yeah. personally don't say a lot of stuff like that is because I don't trust my, I don't want to do the research to, to back my, those opinions, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so that's where I'm at. It's yeah. like people like, for example, and this is another topic that we could hit real quick. Um, it's the perfect example is you did a video on, uh, Gallagher and, um, Crenshaw. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I don't know a thing about yeah. their beef. I don't. And people kept asking me, yeah. what's your opinion on this beef between Crenshaw and Gallagher? Yeah. And I didn't do a video on it because I don't want to put in the research to yeah. learn their beef, to to then formulate an mm-hmm. opinion on it just to answer that question. Yeah. I'm either currently invested in what's going on because mm-hmm. I'm following it out of my own yeah. desires to follow it or I'm not. But I'm not going to. Yeah come out with something that yeah. I, I can't fully get behind yeah. because I think that's <laughs> where we'll step on landmines. Yeah. yeah. I, and it's funny you brought that video up because so I did that video not so much elaborating on the beef that they had. I did that video as a teaching lesson to teach young men, mm. a type dudes, how to handle certain situations. Mm. Right. Because the beef is what it is. Like they clearly had beef. Mm-hmm. Let's say you and I have beef. Right. As a type dudes, especially in the sports, in in the special forces world, we're thought to to square up and just talk about it face to face. Like, hey, you know, Buck, like, what's going on, man? Like, what did I do to you? What caused that caused you to, you know, get to where you are right now? And then you tell me, I take it, I internalize it, and then I come back with a mm-hmm. response. We hash it out behind closed doors, right? Mm-hmm. And we come to a mutual agreement to where, hey, you have your opinion, I have mine. At the end of the day, we're still brothers. We're still fighting for the same cause. It is what it is, right? We hash it out behind closed doors. The reason I did that video was like, hey, like, this is not normal for A-type dudes to, you know, handle business the way that those two were handling business, right? That was the premise behind the entire video. It wasn't to say that, hey, you know, Crenshaw was right or Eddie was, you know, right. It was like, hey, man, you guys have beef? Like, take talk this shit, it. you know, behind closed doors mm. and talk about it, right? Because you have a bunch of young men watching, the whole watching thing. that, yeah. thinking that that's okay. That's how to handle business. And that's a great point. Yeah, and it's fucking not, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> what, what was happening with the way that... So just to, I don't want to pull you off yeah. into something that you yeah. weren't wanting to talk about. But you were wanting to address how they were going about it. What yeah. were they doing? So, um, let me get that. So the premise was that uh, so um, David Goggins uh, was involved. Uh, Crenshaw, I guess, was being two faced, right? He was telling uh, David Goggins one thing. He was telling uh, um, Eddie Gallagher uh, something else, mm-hmm. right? I guess whenever Eddie got rolled up into the whole situation that he was in, he was petitioning. Uh, for support from Crenshaw because he's in um, government. Right. Right. And he was saying that he was doing everything that he could to help him, but in reality, he wasn't. Right. He was trying to keep him in jail mm. and uh, uh, leave him there to rot. Right. Uh, so that was the entire premise behind it. And then um, I guess David Goggins got involved somehow, and then text messages were sent to pretty much paint Crenshaw as a two faced dude that's saying one thing but doing another. Mm. Right. Um, and, and it just kind of hit social media and kind of explode. And if I remember correctly, it wasn't that would, that would lead into wasn't didn't Crenshaw and, and uh, um, Goggins have some beef before, too. So that was already some pre-existing. Yeah. Yeah. Because Goggins. Um, no, well, Crenshaw, Crenshaw said something about Goggins. Yeah. Yeah. Something about a book. He reached out to Goggins about 
a book that he wanted uh, uh, Goggins to uh, endorse. Um, and then he went on a podcast saying, hey, he doesn't think Goggins has come back deployments, blah, blah, blah. Goggins came back and said, yes, you were on that deployment. Yeah, so it was just a, a whole back and, a, a whole lot of back and forth. Mm-hmm. right? And again, as... Which is something that yeah. SF operators do to each other a lot, especially yeah. in this field, by yeah. saying, well, you don't have combat, so you don't get yeah. to, to say, yeah. despite Goggins having helped so many people mm-hmm. with Can't Hurt Me. Yeah. I mean, so many. I love yeah. that book. Yeah. So does he need combat yeah. in order to justify helping millions of people? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I don't but think that's, so either. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not dogging on Crenshaw because I don't yeah. know Crenshaw. I don't know Goggins or Crenshaw. I don't know either, either, either right. of them. But – we're all in this community and this is why we got to be careful about yeah. what we say and how we say it. Yeah. So to but we do this to each other all the time. Yeah. And we talked about it, me and you, when I was yeah. like, uh, dude, you're, you have so much experience in SF yeah. that it's like, it gives you the next level up because yeah. a lot of people could say, well, I was in SF, you know, there's a lot of operators that mm-hmm. do a term and get out like myself. Yeah. Um, but you, you dedicate an entire career to it. Yeah from the time you were 18 to retirement. Yeah. So that gives you, in my opinion, not many people can come back and yeah. say, well, you didn't do this or you didn't do yeah. that. And be, but for some reason, we love doing that to each yeah. other. And having spent an entire you know career, 20 years, dealing with those type of guys, mm-hmm. I see you know the norm as far as how guys handle business, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not gonna lie, t- to see how those guys were doing it, like it scared me that Again, young men were going to think that that's normal. Mm-hmm. That was the premise behind the entire thing was, hey, what these guys are doing, that's not normal, right? If you have beef with somebody, go behind closed doors mm-hmm. and talk about it and hash it out like men, come to a conclusion, and then move on, right? Don't put it on social media because when you put it on social media, that gives people like me access, mm-hmm. people like you access well, to form an opinion. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? and, and honestly, we know. <laughs> Yeah. That putting something on social media is a, a move. Yes. It's not, yes. that's not bickering. That's not trying yeah. to resolve an issue. Yeah. You've crossed the line from, I don't want to solve this anymore. I yeah. want to create publicity and create controversy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really far. I mean, there's people in this community, I won't say names, that yeah. that won't talk to me after yeah. we've talked for a long time. Yeah. And I could easily go on social media and, and say, this person's a jerk or something yeah. like that. But it's like, are they a jerk or maybe yeah. they just don't like my personality yeah. or, or I said something that they're not, it's yeah. their prerogative. Yeah. But, but the minute the day, I go to social media, <laughs> yeah. I've crossed that line yeah. and I put them on blast in a yeah. way that is, is really pretty petty. Yeah. yeah. And so I'll just keep it to myself and yeah. you know, it's his right. You're a, a grown man. Mm-hmm. You don't have to talk who you don't want to talk to. Yeah. So I, I do agree with your approach to trying to get these kids in. And that's yeah. why, you're able to say the things that you yeah. are or you, you're willing to say the things that you are is because at the end of the day, your heart is in it's, helping yeah. these kids. Yeah. And if you keep them at the center of it, you're going to say things that's, yeah. that get some controversy every yeah. once in a while because at the end of the day, their learning lessons mm-hmm. are more important than your relationship with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And I, and, and again, again, everyone has their own prerogative. Mm-hmm. Everybody can do whatever they want on social media for whatever reason that they want to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. But, like you mentioned, if your instinct is to better the next generation, then you need to do things differently. You need to be very careful about how you do things. Mm-hmm. Because being on social media, you're automatically, you know, especially for those guys, they have a pretty decent following. Mm-hmm. So you got to understand, like, when you put stuff out there, like, there's young men watching you. And they're going to, like, the space that we're in right now, as far as day and age, a lot of these young men don't have father figures. Mm-hmm. So they look up to some of those guys. And when I see it, like, it bothers me for some reason, right? It should. Because I know how um, impressionable these young guys are. So, I've had to deal with some of them, you right. know, and I had to Mentor. put them in their place because they don't understand that that's not right. So that kind of leads me to another topic that yeah. I want to ask you about. Uh, sure. And something I'm not... I don't understand, mm-hmm. uh, but I just want to hear your perspective, and I'll, sure. I'll save mine until after you give yours. But sure. um, the do you need more whiskey? No, 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 I'm good, brother. Thank you. The the manosphere. This is something I've just heard that there's a term for, um, and Abel was kind of explaining to me why it's called the manosphere. Have you ever heard that term, manosphere? There's a first for me. Okay, yeah. so apparently the manosphere is this new thing that we have going on where. 
uh, essentially to, and sorry if I get this wrong, but essentially the renaming of toxic masculinity into this whole, whole manosphere thing. So where yeah. you have guys like um, uh, uh, Tate, Andrew, Andrew Tate, Tate. Yeah. and stuff like that to where it's like, okay. And it, I've seen a theme mm-hmm. where it's it seems very much um, lots of tattoos, yeah, lots of steroids, yeah, and lots of advice, yeah. And I just want, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. What yeah. do you think? Do you think that somebody getting out of service and telling people how to fix their lives mm-hmm. is going to help people in, in a real way? And like, is this like super A type manly? I'm the one that you need to be like, and you need to be like me, and I'll help you with first X amount of dollars. Yeah. Do you see value in that? And, and why do you think that that's so popular right now? Yeah. So when it comes to, because I want to address the, I guess, toxic masculinity piece, mm-hmm. and then I'll speak to my truth as far as getting out of service, and then uh, uh, um, we'll address the advice aspect of it. So when I look at uh, tax, toxic masculinity, I look at that term and I'm like, th- there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. You're either masculine or you're not, right? Because um, again, at least for me, like when I look at what I'm doing, because again, I can only speak to my truth, right? I'm trying to find those young men that want to do what I've done, Mm -hmm. right? Because my approach to social media and my YouTube channel is, um, first, I want to show them that I've done some shit, Mm -hmm. right? 20 plus years of military career and special operation at the highest level. And then I want to show them how to get to that point, right? Because success leaves clues. Hey, I've been there. I've done it. This is how I was able to do it. I was able to do it by being a straightforward dude, right? By telling you what I'm thinking, why I'm thinking it, and by doing what I say I'm going to do, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I show them that and I tell them that. If they want to get to the point where I am right now, they're either going to follow me or they won't, mm-hmm. right? That's what it comes down to. This is what worked for me. This is how I was going to do it. Uh, if you want to get to the point where I am right now, this is what I think you should do, right? You either do it or you don't. That's what it comes down to. Um, as far as folks telling people what to do and trying to get money out of them. Um, again, this is social media. You choose who you follow. Um, you choose to give them money, right? You don't know those dudes' track records, right? Because um, there's a lot of, this space has a lot of phony people, mm. right? Um, recently, there was uh, an incident with, somebody that's pretty popular on Instagram, uh, I think it's this Liver King dude, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that goes to show you you need to be careful about who you follow. Right. right? He, um, yeah, he's telling he's uh, telling everyone he was natty for a long time. Yeah, and he's giving advice. Giving advice on how to live the, you know, we did a video on his yeah. uh, the nine tenants, and that's that's a perfect example, actually, yeah, is him, because he's, he's lying to you. Yeah. He's saying that, oh, he eats raw liver. Yeah. But then he uses his size and strength yep. as uh, in the money. So yep. it's always this perception thing, mm-hmm. right? It's like I'm big and buff. Yep. I'll typically get some hand tattoos, some face yep. tattoos, something to stand out, yep. right? So that way they look catchy. And then they show you their house and their cars. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, you want what I have. This and in order to, yep. this is how to do it. Yep. But it seems the issue with it is because it's so close mm-hmm. to someone legitimately trying to help another yep. person, like a, a Jordan Peterson. Yep. Like, a, uh, you know, someone that's, like, putting out books and mm-hmm. putting out content and putting out podcasts yeah. that's solely to help you versus this cr- line-crossing thing mm-hmm. to where now it's, like, a scam. Yeah, and that's that's why I do everything that I can on my channel to show people what I've done, mm-hmm. to include putting my ERB on there, right, putting my DA photo on there, having buddies on the show that serve with me to show folks that I am who I say I am, Mm -hmm. right? So, because I know the line could be blurry in social media, and after watching Liver King go down, Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that the the men that are following me know who they were following, right? They're getting this, you know, like, blunt, you know, SF team sergeant, you know, no no bullshit-taking dude, 
that's going to tell them how it is. Because we both know how the world is. We've been to some of those countries outside of the U.S., you know, that that's the real world. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, there's no bubble. That's reality, right? Um, so we know what's, what's truth. And I take my position in preparing those guys for that. Um, I, as far as everybody else doing it and what they're doing and giving advice, I, I can't really speak to them, right? I just know uh, where I'm coming from as, you know, trying to build up the next soft generation by recreating the next me, right? Yeah. Because I was able to survive it for 20 years. I, th- I think one way to yeah. maybe potentially identify where it's going from really helping someone yeah. to scam is look at the person and look for th- – their honesty about things they've done wrong. Yes. yes. It seems the scam, the people that are in the scam market mm-hmm. are perfect. Yes. And they want to. There's no s- such thing. There's no such thing. <laughs> no fucking such thing. So it's, you know it's I mean? really hard, and especially for, for us yeah. trying to help younger people, mm-hmm. it's hard to watch their um, insecurities be preyed upon. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening yeah. is it's so easy to prey upon a young man's insecurity about who he is as a man, what he's accomplished. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a young man. It could be a man that felt like he wanted to serve in the military mm-hmm. but didn't and now feels like he's trying to make up for that. Yeah. It's a man, another man's insecurities, and we we're preying upon yeah. them by saying, I have everything you want, mm-hmm. and you, I, I have the, also the answer to fixing you. Yeah. And it's like if you could look at another man and say, I could fix you, and I've, I'm perfect, yeah. and you look like that's – Yeah, that's, that's not – that's not accurate because nobody could fix anybody except right. for God, right? If you're religious, like that's the only being that could fix anybody. Absolutely, you can help, you can provide, you know, advice and feedback, mm-hmm. but ultimately it's between that dude and God to actually fix their issues. Right. Just like when somebody comes to me and they're like, "Hey, Jay, I need help," you know, passing whatever um, event at selection. I'm like, dude, I can't. I can give you some tools, but whether you pass that event or not is entirely up to you because. Mm-hmm. I can't give you my heart, <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Because that's what you're going to need to pass certain things. Mm-hmm. You got to have, you got to know what your why is, and you got to have the work ethic, and you got to have the heart to actually go through that process, mm-hmm. right? And that's another thing that I preach all the time. It's like, dude, I can tell you exactly what's going to be on the test, but you still have to show up and perform, mm-hmm. right? So um, that's that's one way to look at it. Right? So, so then my question would to be to you would be if you have all these young men and yeah. they, they're they're all insecure, right? Because we all are. Yeah. Even us now, we have our own insecurities. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. We have so many faults. I, I deal with uh, PTSD, mm-hmm. anxiety, um, social anxieties through the roof. Yeah. Uh, I have issues for days, and I'm constantly working on those issues. Mm-hmm. You know, anger management and all this stuff. I'm, I'm constantly trying my best yeah. to, to bring in and to hone in to be, to be better, right? Yeah. So if you had all these, these young men and th- these insecurities, and they're looking at you, which they're going to, because – being special forces, whether you're Ranger, SEAL, Green Beret, uh, MARSOC, mm-hmm. is universally accepted as a difficult thing to do. Correct. So that it, once you achieve that, it gives you a position in society mm-hmm. to say, I am a tough person. Yes. And I think that is extremely rare in our society to, to say, I am a tough person and I have – this thing that supports that mm-hmm. and I think that we're, we kind of are blessed in that sense from special forces to give us that it's yeah. like like a, like almost like a, a warrior in you know Roman or mm-hmm. Roman warrior or something like you you've gotten this actual physical representation that you've crossed that line yeah. into a to being a tough human being mm-hmm. um, and I think that's what a lot of people strive for is yeah. they want that too but they don't they're not going to join the military. They don't want to, yeah. you know, and, and it's not for everybody. And uh, a lot of people probably shouldn't just because it's, yeah. it's, there's a it's, lot of downsides to yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's not for everybody. Right. Yeah. So what would your advice be to them to feel when they sit in a room, if they came and sit next to us, mm-hmm. that they would not feel insecure, they not feel less than us because yeah. they don't have a title yeah. that society deems as tough? Yeah. So I think it goes back to purpose and direction, mm-hmm. like whatever – those individuals are meant to do they need to find out what their passion is right so if their if their passion if they if their intent is to join special operation then they can sit down with folks like us right mm-hmm. um and do that to the highest level if their passion is business then they can sit down with 
you know, a Donald Trump or whoever, and they can be the best at that. I'm sure if you and I walk in a room with Donald Trump and, you know, some other billionaire, Jeff Bezos, like, we're going to feel some type of way, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're going to feel as if we're not, you know, equal to him, right? So uh, to answer your question, like, you and I are just human beings. We're, mm-hmm. we're, we're men like everyone else. Uh, that's why I always make it my purpose to treat everyone that I meet um, like they're men, mm-hmm. whether they're support kids or just civilian. Just like I'm, just because I'm this special forces operator doesn't mean I'm any better than anyone else, right? right? So I guess um, I would just let them know, like, hey, whenever you're in a space with Green Berets or a special forces operator, just know that we're men just like everyone else, right? And we're not these, uh, you know, giant freaking dudes that don't have issues, that don't have problems, just like everyone else, right? Right. So and hopefully we, that that answered your, your, it your does. question. And I think it's important that people know that we can't yeah. give them that ominous dominus mm-hmm. we can't say congratulations now you're you know you're at the tier of yeah. a man yeah. because like i said that's w- the whole idea that you're confident it's not yeah. being a man it's just being confident in who you are yeah. depends on what you're like you said what your purpose is yeah. and are you fulfilling that purpose or not yeah. so and especially when you get out on in the civilian world like i go to a jiu-jitsu gym no one cares that I'm a Green Beret. Yeah, they care no. about jujitsu. Yeah. So yeah. every every new realm has their height. Mm-hmm. And once you get out of your the height of your realm, jump into someone else's, yeah. you're back on the bottom. Okay. And the only thing that is keeping you, you know, okay with that is keeping your ego in check mm-hmm. and understanding that everyone has their own mountain to climb. Yeah. But we can't give you the approval that no. you're looking for. We never will be able to do that. No. I could take you and, and smoke you for two days. Mm-hmm. I could you know, make you do push-ups until you throw yep. up. But at the end of the day, special forces is given, in special operations is giving that, given that um, level in society because of the whole experience. That we had to go through. That we had yeah. to go through. I can't then, just because I went through that, I yeah. can't then pass that on to you yeah. in a similar experience. No, I agree. So I, I, agree. I think people need to be very careful about yeah. special operations people trying to give them a pass yeah. for being men because yeah. we can't do that no no we can't and um i think it's one of those um and again not to knock the folks that are doing it mm-hmm. it is what it is mm-hmm. um but to to get to the level that we're at as far as confidence accountability um leadership like we had to go through the grinder mm-hmm. like, we had to experience certain things and truth be told it's some of the stuff that you know regular civilian will never experience Mm -hmm. so to say that you come to this course and you're going to come out on the other end like jay or like buck like that's misleading Mm -hmm. and i think um some folks are going to take that and run with it and think that's the case right that's what i talk about when i say you know understanding that you have a responsibility being on social media to the folks that uh, are following you, right? Because if you tell them that, they're going to believe you Mm -hmm. and then they're going to go through this process and they're going to be like, wait a minute, like, I don't feel like you. I don't look like you. Like, what's going on? You have to set that expectation. Yeah, uh, look... For folks. Exactly. Sorry to interrupt. Look at who's giving the advice Mm -hmm. and say, are they giving me a shortcut? Yeah. Or are they telling me I have to work really hard. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a long process and more of a realistic approach. And if it's the realistic approach, that probably tells you something. Yeah. (laughs) If it's if it's a a shortcut that bypasses years and years and Mm -hmm. years of hard work into uh, a too good to be true fraction of a time, it's too good to be true. Yeah. (laughs) And it's not it's not a solution. Yeah. They're not giving you the answer. (laughs) Because when folks reach out to me through Instagram, you know, folks that are looking at going to selection. And they're like, hey, how do I, you know, crush selection? And I'm like, well, where are you at in, you know, your process? Mm-hmm. Oh, I never worked out a day in my life. I'm, you know. You got a long way to go. Yeah, like I'm about to start now. And mm-hmm. I'm like, well, shit, man, you better get started mm-hmm. because I can't sit here and tell you there's a magic. Like I can't sit here and tell you, hey, go into Patreon and sign up for my prep courses. And then 16 weeks later, you're going to be ready. Right. right. Because if I say that. That yep. 18, that 19-year-old, he's going to go into Patreon, he's going to sign up for it, and then he's going to come out on the back end thinking that he's ready. He's going to go to selection and get his fucking soul crushed, mm-hmm. right? But, again, 
understanding that and knowing the power that I have, I make sure I set ex- expectation. Mm-hmm. I can easily do that to get a sale, but it goes back to why am I doing this, right? right? And I think that's what uh, this space is missing a lot of. Absolutely. Right? Is that is that, you know, I don't want to say morals, but character traits. I mean, character traits, and, yeah. and there's some moral aspect to it. Oh yeah. And oh, you yeah. should feel, you should feel level of guilt mm-hmm. if you're preying on people yeah. just to take their money yeah. and using your position to yeah. take their money. And I'm not yeah. pointing at anybody specific. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a thing. It is a thing. It's a thing. That's reality. Right. And it's a thing. It's a <laughs> you know thing. I mean? And I'm not saying yeah. that this person's doing it. I don't yeah. have a person in mind. I don't. Yeah. I was on social media swiping through Instagram. Yeah. This is really what brought it up. And there's this guy pops up and he's got a face tattoo. Yeah. He's super jacked. Yeah. And he's just giving me all these lessons on life and yeah. how I need to fix my life and how yeah. he could fix my life and I'm like you, you don't know me you yeah. don't know my problems yeah. I don't know your problems yeah. and you're you're just telling me that you have the answer yeah. to fix my life mm-hmm. because physically you're imposing yeah. and it's like I, I've taken steroids before yeah. I know what steroids do I've taken yeah. steroids not I've taken steroids in two two aspects yeah. I've taken it in um, doctor prescribed mm-hmm. uh, so I know how you know people that are on um TRT. TRT. Yeah. I know what it does not do, yeah. you know, which is because I did the other way. Yeah. I did it very much uh, to, uh, for growth, and I gained yeah. 20 pounds in, in four weeks. Mm-hmm. So I've done both, yeah. you know, and, and people on TRT, you're not getting this massive no. thing. No. It's just – it's essentially getting you back to normal. But anyway, yeah. but I've also done – just straight up, I want to get as big as possible yeah. in Afghanistan. <laughs> get on the CRIF program. Get, yeah, get on the CRIF program, and, and I've and I've juiced up. And yeah. so to the frustrating thing for me is to watch people take steroids and then come at you and yeah. tell you you need to look like me. Yeah. But it's like I gained twenty pounds of muscle in yeah. four weeks. That's not healthy. It's not, <laughs> bro. No. It's not healthy. Yeah. It's not good for my body. Yeah. Uh, it's not good for. Uh, it's not it's not hard yeah. it's not difficult to obtain mm-hmm. the most difficult part was getting our hands on yeah. on legitimate steroids mm-hmm. then once we do that every time i go into the gym i'm working out half as hard as i usually do yeah. for twice the gain yeah the the point i'm getting is just that people need to be very careful about yeah. who they taking advice from and yeah. if there's anyone that's giving you the quick answer yeah. it's there's no such thing that's like taking lipo or doing the lipo surgery to lose weight right mm-hmm. the, it, it doesn't exist, but there's such a, especially with this generation, there's such a gap um, for information as far as how to be men to where anybody could just jump on there and say anything mm-hmm. and folks are just going to latch onto it. There's just such a freaking gap there, man. And yeah. I, I don't know where that gap comes from, right? Because again, the last 20 years I've been head buried in the sand doing mm-hmm. work in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I don't know how we got to the point where we are right now, but there's just such a gap uh, in leadership as far as men being men and men doing manly shit. You know, it, it's being labeled as, you know, toxic masculinity, like th- th- to a young men, because at the end of the day, men are going to recognize um, just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, men are going to recognize good advice when they see it. Mm. Um because it'll actually help. Yeah. Instead yeah. of just giving you a momentary feeling exactly. good exactly. and then send you on your way and yeah. two days later you're right yeah. back to where you were exactly. with no plan yeah. to do better. Yeah. Which is why like cuz I get passionate on my channel, right? Mm-hmm. When I see like dumb stuff that are going to take young men down the the, the wrong path. Mm-hmm. Because especially being on social media, man, like I I I I think it's our job to steer them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I first started doing this, uh, one of my mentors told me like, hey, if you go out there and you provide value and you truly help people, the money will come, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but if you go into it just for money, you're going to lose yourself in trying to make that money. Absolutely. Right? So as long as you have uh, the right intent, and you truly want to help these young men, like the money's gonna come eventually mm-hmm. as you solve, you know, problems for these young dudes. That's right? exactly it. Yeah. You got you're solving, you're finding ways to solve problems, yeah. Yeah. which is all we wanted when we were in special operations. Yeah. Is yeah. like, 
uh, you know, these boots suck. How do I get better ones? Exactly. This training sucks. How yeah. can I get a better tool for this? Correct. And if you're sol- if you're solving those problems, I mm-hmm. mean, that's that's to the benefit of society. Yeah. Everyone that's doing that yeah. in all walks of business yeah. is thinking about society as a whole when yeah. they f- they find a problem and they solve it yeah. and then they make money off it. Yeah. It's just that's the way it's supposed yeah. to work. Yeah. Instead Not of trying enough. to find the shortcut yeah. and lie to you about eating liver. <laughs> And then collecting as much money as you can until, you know. That shit blew my mind, man. Like, the amount of the amount of following that that guy had and the fact that he was able to fool him for so long just blows my mind. And, like, and again, this message is for everyone on social media. Like, I don't care who they are, right? You got to understand, like, these young men, like, whenever you and I are 60, 70, like, they're the ones that's going to be, you know, leading and in, in, in defending this country, mm-hmm. right? So the fact that you're an influencer and you're able to influence these young men, you need to do them right. Mm-hmm. Because that could mean, you know, like he could, that young man that's following you, he can be the next president eventually one day, right? Something that you say could motivate him to be the next president, right? Or Absolutely. something that you said could destroy him and, you know, not allow him to, to live his true purpose. Yeah, like when they take your supplements and can't look like you. Correct. And now they're, they're, they're their fucking morals self-esteem crushed. Yeah. is crushed. Yeah. Everything is crushed because yeah. you told them that if they ate this vitamin, yeah. they're going to be jacked like you. Yeah. They put all the work in, they did mm-hmm. the right thing, and they still don't look like you. Yeah. And now what are they left with? Yeah. As opposed to being just blunt, just, mm-hmm. just, just be honest mm-hmm. and just tell them the truth. Like, hey, you take this, you still have to do the work, mm-hmm. right? Like, I got to the point where I'm right now by doing X, Y, and Z. That's what worked for me, mm-hmm. right? If you want to do X, Y, and Z, you could use this, you know, uh, a template. But just understand, like, there's no easy button. There's no uh, easy path to getting to towards success. Right. And so that kind of leads yeah. me to uh, another question is, and this is something I talked about in the book is, and I just touched on it. And mm-hmm. so I think a lot of people without father figures uh, yeah. and then without proper mentors. Uh, and it's something that you're doing really well at yeah. is they don't know finances. Yeah. And so a lot of young men, especially like when I was growing up, mm-hmm. no one taught me about money. And I, what I saw was just everyone spending every cent they got the minute they got it. Yeah. So when you live in poverty, it's like you don't believe that any more will come because yeah. you don't trust your ability to create more mm-hmm. legitimately and then turn more into more. Yeah. So whenever you get it, you try to treat it like a small vacation yeah. and you can get a bonus from the government. You can mm-hmm. get um, welfare. The minute you get paid, it's gone. Yeah. And so then we find ourselves in this trap and yeah. these young people are not able to dig themselves out and they have you know massive amounts of credit card mm-hmm. debt and you know, brand new vehicles that they're having to get repossessed and their credit scores are getting annihilated. Yeah. So they're finding themselves in these horrible financial situations with just no shot at yeah. having a really good life because nobody taught them about finances. How did you, can you just give a little bit of history on like, what do you do as an, an entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you're in real estate. How did you get to that point and how yeah. did you get that knowledge base to start applying to become successful in such a, uh, you're like, you're already successful in the military yeah. and you're like, that's not enough. I have the drive and I want to be really successful. Yeah. And so you went into real estate. So for me, it all started um, off with my uh, uh, background, right? Because again, I grew up, I was born in Haiti, um, probably the poorest country um, in the Eastern he- he- Hemisphere. Um, so coming from that part of the world and then migrating to the US, uh, being one out of eight kids, like I've experienced poverty. Um, and I joined the military um, as a way out, as a way to escape um, my poverty. And once I joined the military, um, I told myself that I will not only never experience poverty again, but I will make sure that my offspring never go through that again. Mm. I'm a, a big believer in that at some point, somebody in your family heritage has to break that uh, poverty cycle, Mm -hmm. right? If you study, like I've studied the greats, whether it's uh, 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 Donald Trump, right? Um, His father was the one that broke that cycle for them, came over from Germany, uh, started in real estate, building projects in New York City, right? 
uh, the Vanderbilt, like all those guys. Like I've studied them and I figured out like how were they able to do it. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, <laughs> Arnold. Yeah. He's another one. He's mm-hmm. a big fan of mine, right? Because I started him. I started following him for fitness, and then I realized like he's a big he he's a big real estate mm-hmm. guy, right? Um, so in studying those individuals and realizing that they were immigrants, right, and they were able to um, experience wealth. I joined the military, and of course, the first <laughs> the first five years, the first six years, it didn't click, right? Because mm-hmm. I came out of you know New York City poverty. As soon as I got that reenlistment bonus, dude, I balled out, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I had the I bought the ex-wife a Mercedes. I had the Lincoln, you know, like I just blew the money, mm. right? Um, because I was just happy to have money. Mm-hmm. It didn't click for me till 2014. Um, I was 31. Uh, I was in Afghanistan, and uh, me and my teammates were playing Monopoly. Right? We uh, just got back from a 24-hour op. Uh, we were playing Monopoly, and I, 2014. So in 2000 and 12 my my dad he lost uh our house in new york city because he bought his first house in new york city it was a uh variable interest rate and the interest rate was just going high and somehow um my mom got laid off and he wasn't able to uh uh, pay that mortgage he came to me for help um and i was just so in and gross and work and all that stuff like I didn't end up helping him and he lost the house Mm. and I remember playing Monopoly and sitting there and saying holy crap like my dad just lost the house I'm living paycheck to paycheck like something has to give and something just clicked and it was like you know what the Dorliest last name is going to mean something in this country Mm. right we came from poverty we came from nothing Um, I'm going to make sure that my last name means something. If not for me, for my kids. I didn't have kids at that time either. Um, But I was thinking about having kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't want my kids to go through the same thing that I went through, right? Um, So with that in mind, I started to educate myself. Uh, But the most important thing within that scenario is my mindset shift, right? I went from enjoying the luxury thing the uh uh, buying cars and buying clothes and you know going out and partying to you know what i want to start building something so my mindset had to change and once it did then i went to work on educating myself Mm. so i read the books rich dad poor dad right i read all the real estate books that you can think of i got on bigger pockets and then start listening to all the audio uh section about real estate and once i was smart enough that year, I went in depth. Um, and for the audience that, does, that doesn't know what in depth means, it just means at my 10 year mark, I'd sign my final contract, taking me to 20, right? Um, and I got a $56,000 bonus, right? Um, with that money, I knew I'm going to use that money to start building my empire. Nice. Um, so I got back 2014. Um, I got a realtor, I got a, um, a loan lady, and I just started looking for foreclosures. Right, and I just started buying foreclosures, mm. uh, 2014. Four years later, um, I had six houses. Um, Monopoly was my strategy. I traded two of them in, nice. and then I bought my first apartment complex. Uh, and then since then, I've just been building the portfolio. Right, I say all that to say again, I made a decision to um, quit being, you know, part of the rat race. Mm-hmm. Right, I wanted better. I wanted more for my offspring. I didn't want them to go through the same thing that I went through. Uh, so that's what led me down the path of financial uh, literacy and eventually uh, uh, just investing in uh, real estate. Oh, I love that. I yeah. love that because first it gives gives young people the, the roadmap. It's mm-hmm. like first has to happen the mind sh- mindset shift. Man. You have to stop to. thinking. Yeah. So one of the, some of the research I was doing for my book, that they were talking about how people that uh, yeah. see their future selves – uh, in detail, they mm-hmm. start to connect with that future self, so therefore yeah. their their current actions have value, yeah. right? As to where when you're in poverty, you're living this kind of moment to moment, so you never 
see your future self. You yeah. don't envision your future self. You're like, oh, well, I'll have what I have when I get there. Yeah. So then you, you never take the time to, yeah. to make that mindset shift and be like, okay, no, it's all about the future. It's going to be better. Yeah. It's going to be good. And yeah. so it's worth making the sacrifice yeah. now. But to then to go into, you know, owning apartment buildings, mm-hmm. I mean, that's massive. Yeah. So now we have somebody, you're, you're, you're physically fit. Yeah. So you have that going in your favor, which is bringing the confidence yeah. from a fit body. I mean, there's yeah. there's no arguing. Oh yeah, yeah. That having a fit body. That's where it started, right? Being able to build confidence in mm-hmm. the gym, right? That's because again, going back to Arnold, like I would always like as a young kid, like I followed him, and I would go to the gym and experience hardship under you know the squat rack, mm-hmm. the bench, like that. <laughs> it's it's a weird way to tie it in, but every time I was, you know, in the squat rack or on the bench lifting heavy stuff, I always imagined me, um, you know, like being out in the world and doing heavy stuff, mm-hmm. right? I'm like, you know what? This is the world right here, and I'm going to squat it, or this is the world, I'm going to bench it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I've always had that mindset, and I think that played a like, um, that played a lot into it. Absolutely. Right? So um, then you're, you're completing the circle mm-hmm. of it, and so then yeah. you got, you're thinking about your family, yes. so your mindset's there for your family, mm-hmm. you're putting them first. You're getting a fit body so you could have the benefits yeah. of that and the confidence. Yeah. Then you're adjusting your mentality to start focusing on yeah. your future self and providing for your future self yeah. and providing for your kids. Yeah. And so that's where the changes start to happen. Yeah. So if anyone starts to come in and tell you like, oh, you just got to do what I tell you in, yeah. in the course of two days or take this one class. And it's like, no. That's not a thing. This is No, it's not a thing. No. This is a hard, hard process. <laughs> that has a series of things that you have to do yep. and take advantage of yep. in order to achieve that. Yep. So I think that's awesome. Yep. One thing, and then here's, we'll switch topics a little bit, because mm-hmm. I want to talk about this, some of that people ask me about all the time. They're constantly asking me when I started the channel, can you have a black operator <laughs> on your show? Well, I'm here. <laughs> and, and you're here. And I asked Kurt, yeah. so Kurt's half black, yeah. half white. And so I was like, Kurt, do you, do you want to yeah. do that for, you know, speak on the, because everyone wants to know. There's yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, the black community wants to know, like, hey, there's so few operators. Like, yeah. what is it like for us? Are we yeah. are we accepted like everybody else? Mm-hmm. Are we going to face hardships? Um, and Kurt had, an, he, he his whole approach was, I can't do it yeah. for on behalf of the black community because I'm only half, which makes me look Hispanic. Yeah. You know, so that was kind of his approach is that it's like, well, I don't yeah. look black. So I yeah. maybe not I may not have the full yeah. experience of a, of a black man. So he didn't want to do it. So now you're here. Let's do it. So <laughs> what is it like joining a community mm-hmm. where the the black community is so underrepresented? Yeah. Um, and what was it like for you? And did you yeah. feel any difference? Um, what yeah. advice would you have for other black men and women that yeah. want to be in the that uh you know special forces community yeah so um it was awesome right uh so i want to get that out of the way and there is a lot of preconceived notions Mm. out there which is one of the reasons why i wanted to get on uh, social media and just show uh the young you know black dude black girls out there that hey i'm able to do it you can do it too Mm. right uh now to get into some of my experiences uh going into it Again, mindset has a lot to do with it, right? I grew up in New York City. I, I grew up in a melting pot, right? Mm. I've never, I was never told that I can't do something because of how I look, though I shouldn't do something because of how I look. So I don't know what that looks like or what that world is like. Uh, when I joined the military, again, I was around diversity. Uh, so going into special operation, of course, I stumbled on it, right? Because a squad leader of mine went. Uh, didn't make it, and then I went out and I tried out. Uh, when I got there, selection, I just performed, right? I performed to the best of my ability. At no point in time did I was looked at any different than anybody else that was there, right? At no point in time did I look around and say, holy crap, nobody around here looks like me. Because mm. again, my, my mindset wasn't there. I just wanted to do the job at the best uh, of my ability, right? Because my, you know, mindset has always been like, if I'm going to be in that space, I might as well do the best job that I can. Uh, so I got to selection, no issues. Um, I know swim test is a big thing. Uh, I didn't have any issues with it. 
I understand why it's a big thing, right? Because growing up in inner cities, there weren't a lot of pools mm. for uh, African Americans to go practice swimming. I, I had to learn how to swim once I got to Fort Riley, my first duty station. Because again, <laughs> a lot of folks are telling me, well, you're, you're from Haiti, you're from the island. Like, why don't you know how to swim? Well, because I was eight, man, and I was busy <laughs> doing other things, all right? <laughs> so I learned how to swim when I got to Fort Riley, Kansas, right? Um, so I went to selection, no issues there. Uh, went to the Q course. Again, I worked my butt off, and I ended up graduating, right? And we'll hit the Q course and selection for a minute. I think if you, as a minority, go into it with the right mindset of just performing because you want to be elite, you won't have any issues. And I get these questions a lot mm -hmm. because now that I'm on YouTube, a lot of guys reach out to me saying, hey, you're a black dude, I'm a black dude, like, what's it like? Am I going to be looked at different? Like, what's going on? And I have to tell them right away, hey, check it out, man. Like, quit that bullshit right here. Mm -hmm. Like, you're on the phone with me. That enough should be enough proof that, hey, this is possible. Mm -hmm. Next thing I want you to do is change your mindset because you can't go into it with this preconceived notion that society has put into you. You can't go into it thinking that, hey, because you're black, Hispanic, Muslim, or whatever, that you don't belong. Because what, what that's gonna do is when you hit selection and something happens, instead of taking personal responsibility and accountability for your actions, now you're gonna start thinking, oh, this happened because I'm black. Or Kadra's doing this because I'm Hispanic. When that's not the fucking case at all. They're there to assess you and to make sure you're the right person. Mm. But when you have that preconceived notion in the back of your head, you're going to start tying it to other things, which mm. is going to lead it to snowball. Right? So the fact that I didn't have that mindset when I hit selection, the Q course group, I didn't have any issues at all. Right? Uh, so I think it's, yeah, we're under. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of us there because society has put that preconceived notion in a lot of us. Uh, thinking that we don't belong, so a lot of guys don't try out, right? When that's not the case at all. Mm. So my entire state group was awesome, man. I was able to do, like I said, the senior trolley job, the senior, uh, the junior trolley job, uh, the team song job, the first song job, and I was looking at making song major, right? So it's possible to serve at the highest level there. Yeah, you didn't just make it. You made it all the way up. Correct, yeah. correct. So that within itself shows guys that, hey, this is possible, right? You just got to go out there and do it. Mm -hmm. But before you even attempt to do it you need to change your mindset and you know it's it's you mentioned that and it's like uh i have a little of that issue myself mm -hmm. even as a white guy uh growing up in poverty and now living in a you know i worked really hard to live yeah. in the neighborhood that you I almost live. feel like you don't belong right? i feel like i don't belong <laughs> yeah and i have tattoos on my hands yeah. i got my back's all tattooed yeah. and so when i go out for runs i was running with kurt in my neighborhood yeah. and everyone's saying hi to kurt and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I was like, yo, these are my neighbors. And like, they, in my mind, they, yeah. they don't accept me because yeah. somehow they could see that I'm yeah. from poverty. Yeah. And like, I'm, I, I'm, I got imposter syndrome yeah. living in my own neighborhood. Yeah. And I, I feel like in my head, they're seeing my, my poor, they're seeing my tattoos, yeah. you know, they're seeing the way I grew up. Yeah. Somehow they could see it in my face and yeah. they don't accept me. And then so Kirk comes over and everyone's like, oh, hey, hey, and they're all waving to him and stuff. And I was like, why the hell are everyone so nice to you? Kirk is just less Kirk, intimidating. He's just, Nothing against you, Kirk. <laughs> and then Kirk looks at me and goes, well, do you ever wave at them first? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, I guess not. <laughs> yeah, it, it's all but in it's, our heads, man. It's 100% yeah. right. What you said yeah. is the minute you put that in your yeah. head, it's so hard not to yeah. go to it immediately. Mm -hmm. The minute someone, if you even think they looked at you funny, it's yeah. because of, uh, my, I'm poor. It's because I'm hand tats. It's because I don't fit in here. It's because they they know that I'm not mm -hmm. like one of them. Yeah. And so I can only imagine that having because my wife is Peruvian, so yeah. um, she's had some issues, some feelings yeah. uh, when we moved to Texas. She never had in Colorado. Mm -hmm. When we moved to Texas, she's like. I don't know if it's because I'm brown, but yeah. like they, I feel like they treat me different. But it's like she never had that, and then once it happened that one time, it's almost like a, a switch. It's confirming. Yeah. It's confirming, and yeah. so you're always kind of looking for that confirmation. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's amazing advice is to just yeah. get that out of your head yeah. and say I'm a human being yeah. that has a desire to be here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to work really hard to earn yeah. that spot, and they're going to judge me based on how hard I work. Yeah, because another thing that's going to happen too. Right. So let's say you have it, you haven't changed your mindset and you've somehow made it all the way through and you get to the special forces team. Mm. Right. I'll tell you right now, when I was a team sergeant, 
I had no fucking time for that shit. Like, if I get a black dude that came on the team and he had that chip on his shoulder, mm. dude, I got rid of him immediately, mm. right? Because I don't want him affecting my team room dynamics, right? Because I want somebody that's there to perform because they earn the right to be there. Black, white, Hispanic, yellow, brown, I didn't care. Mm. You're here as an SF dude, you're here to perform. If you have a chip on your shoulder and at every corner your teammates have to walk on eggshell because, you know, like you, you, you have that mindset that, you know, like you're black and, you know, everybody's going to treat you different. Now, as soon as they do something, you're going to take it the wrong way mm. and you're going to start, you know, commotion in my team room, disrupting that team that room dynamics. Like, like I, I was the first one that, like, doing my counseling session, I was like, hey, man, like, where, like, where's your mindset at? Like, where are you at? Right? Because if you told me the wrong thing, sorry, dude, this team ain't for you. Go mm. back to the B team. Right? Because... Those other teammates, again, it's not a secret to them. Like, they know what society has ingrained mm -hmm. in African Americans. So when you step foot in that team room, there's 11 other dudes that don't look like you looking at you, try to, you know, size you up and trying to figure out where you're at. Like, is he one of those dudes that, you know, like, we got to be a certain way around? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Can I talk freely? Like, can I do this? Is he going to get upset? They don't want the angry black dude in their team room, mm. right? But if you show up as the angry black dude, now everybody's got to be on there. Like, no one has time for that, right? We're trying to get ready to go downrange and do work. So you have to change that mindset. Because once you're part of that team, the other dudes don't care, man. They just want a solid dude that's going to go downrange, that's going to have their back, that's going to be out for their best interest. Mm -hmm. That's all it's about, right? That's all it comes down to, right? And, again, I'm living proof of it. I went in the team room, no fucking chip on my shoulder, right? I went through FNG stuff just like everyone else, mm -hmm. and I made it on the back. Like, I made it out and then deployed, and everything was good. Yeah, no up, issues whatsoever. Up, 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 up. Yeah, exactly. Almost a sergeant major. Exactly. Right. Like, no issues whatsoever. So, but it all it all comes down to, and it starts with having the right mindset. Nice. Yeah. So, that being said, let's jump into another kind of, or not another, but let's jump into a little bit more of a controversial topic, mm -hmm. and that's women in SF. Yeah. So. I took I talked about this on the channel and I took the approach of yeah. my daughters right yeah. and looking at it if they wanted to do SF it would mm -hmm. it would really bother me that they wouldn't be able to do it yeah. but then I also know that when I was in if you were to tell me that a woman was coming to the team I would be lying to say that yeah. I would be uncomfortable with it yeah. so what what's your take on yeah um, so again there's reality mm -hmm. <laughs> right which is the, word, the space that we're in, right, reality, um, and there's what everyone th thinks it should be. When it comes to, because I have a daughter, same concept. Mm -hmm. I want her to do whatever it is that she wants to be. I want her to do whatever she wants to do. I think we all want that for mm -hmm. our kids. It's also our job as fathers to protect our kids. Mm -hmm. You and I both know the savages that are in the fucking team. Right? Oh, yeah. We used to be one of them. Yep. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I don't so, want them near my kids. <laughs> exactly. So that's the perspective that I'm looking at it from, Right. Like, I know how we were when we were in, in the actual teams. Like, I know what takes place in there. Mm -hmm. And it's not saying that a woman can't do the job, because they can, right? There's units out there that are employing them in the right capacity. So they can definitely do the job, right? It's understanding once you put a woman in that team room, what it's going to do to the team, what it's going to do to the team room dynamics. And I revert back to the early years when we had the CSTs. Right? I don't know if you remember them, the combat support teams. That's where uh, doing VSO, they would take a, a team of females, a captain and a lower enlisted, and they would uh, attach them to a special forces team uh, downrange, and their job was to search uh, uh, females on the objective. But during the six, eight, even 10 months that the team was you know, out, those females would live with the teams. Right. And dude, like I've heard horror stories. I've experienced horror stories of teams just imploding. Right. You had team Sarn doing extracurricular activities with one female while the 18 Bravo was doing the same. Mm. Now the team Sarn and the 18 Bravo, they're fighting. Guys are going to be guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's get that. Let's 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 get that out of the way. Yep. I understand the comments is going to say, hey, well, females do this. Well, guys should be professional this. Check it out, man. Like, again, we live in reality. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to be guys. 
Females are going to be females. Guys are wired a certain way. Females are wired a certain way. Let's get that shit out of the way, mm-hmm. right? So it's not to say that they can't do the job. I think that we need to look at it from a reality perspective as far as what it's going to do to that team room, right? And I'm also a big uh, believer in, hey, before you actually try to run a social experiment in the military, let's test it out in a space that's less or that's more forgiving, Mm. right? Right. Um, Because I... I did a lot of research on this um, because on my YouTube channel, I have, you know, females reaching out, wanting me to answer questions. And I tell them the truth. Like, hey, yeah, yes, you can do it. Dude, that's like me saying, hey, just because I'm a man, I could beat Ronda Rousey. Right? Like, she's probably going to beat my ass. Right? So I know they can do the job. Um, but whether they want to and whether they want to deal with that stuff is a different um, issue. So if you're going to run that experiment, instead of having... WNBA and the NBA, just have the NBA and integrate there and see how that works out. Mm. Right? Because that's less forgiving. You know, try the NFL. Let's integrate there because that's less forgiving. Right? Because that's sport at the highest level. But then you have special operations, sports at the highest level there where if you lose, you don't come back home. Right? So let's try it there, see how, how that works. Right? Because now you have super elite dudes uh competing with super elite females, right? Kind of like in special operation where you have a bunch of super elite dudes. Now, if you want to put a bunch of super elite females there and see how that works out, I don't think that's a space to do it because if something goes wrong there, people are fucking dying Hmm. as opposed to if something goes wrong over here, then you lose a game, you know, you go back, you know, home and you're pissed off, whatever. That's more forgiving. Maybe try it there first and see if that works out before you, you know, go into special operation and uh, make it happen there. You know, you mentioned a good point when it comes to advising them on, yes, you can do it, but do you want to? And really, that's the approach we take with everyone Mm -hmm. who wants to go SF. Mm -hmm. It's like, sure, you you can sign up for 18X right now. There's so many guys out there that can sign up right now for 18X. And it's our job as kind of like the first line of... SF guys, because yeah. we really are the first line. Yeah, we're the, the way you, who they see. <laughs> they yeah, you to come first. to us yeah. before you go to the recruiter. Yeah, so we're your first level of information before mm-hmm. you're getting to your recruiter. They're yeah. devouring your channel. They're devouring the views of my yeah. channel to learn as much as they can. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to be honest with all of them about just because you can go do this doesn't mean you should, or doesn't yeah. mean that you want to, or that you will be happy doing yeah. it. So I think you're you're doing a service by ha- by saying okay. This may not be the answer you want to hear, but understand that I'm not trying to say that I don't want you there. I'm trying to understand that maybe you don't want to be there, Correct. and this is the reasons why. And you need to have that in your head uh, because maybe that particular – that individual, uh, that particular woman mm-hmm. is the kind that doesn't deal – with men hitting on her she yeah. doesn't worry about that maybe maybe the way that she carries herself is not the type that is going to have that issue mm-hmm. so then it's a case by case yeah. basis but for a lot of women that think potentially they'll be coming into an environment where it's all bros and yeah. hugging is going to realize that this is like you're you could potentially be throwing meat into yeah. a den of wolves you know it's like in that it, it, sound, it makes SF guys kind of sound barbaric, but like you said, it's it's just men who are overseas mm-hmm. for long periods of time, bored, lonely. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's alcohol involved. Mm-hmm. It could just potentially be a really no. bad situation. And no. would I want my daughter in that situation? Fuck Absolutely no, not. No, no. And again, it's it's expectation management. Like mm-hmm. I want the public to understand the type of man that serves in special operation. Nothing about us is normal. It, that's the type of person it takes to do the work that we do. Mm. And I've, I, dude, like, I've, I've seen it for the past 15 years. Like, nothing about that job is normal, which is why we get spit out on the back end so fucked up. It is what it is. That's the reality of it. That's what we signed up for. Like, nothing about that job, nothing about being in that space is normal. Right. Right? The shit that we see, the shit that we have to do, like, nothing about it is normal. And I think that's a perspective that the 
policymakers, that the um, the civilian folks are missing when they, you know, hear these comments and they get all wild up. Like, like, bro, you see Buck and I sitting here talking like civilized people, but you don't see our teammates that's sitting in his living room playing Russian roulette with a fucking revolver. Yeah, I just lost uh, another guy from my company a couple weeks ago. Dude, you don't see that, mm-hmm. right? As a first sergeant, like, I'm standing out there with a dude who's freaking staring out a freaking pistol from a cop that's about to shoot him because this dude is so messed up. He thought he was back at Sear and he's Ian Ian and he's got a pistol drawn on him and I'm having to talk the cop down from, from shooting him. Mm. Like, that's what war does to these individuals, right? That, th- those are the type of folks that we're having to deal with. Now, imagine having your little girl in that mix. Right. Like, dude, like, I don't want that for my little girl. Mm-hmm. No, no, I don't want that. And if, again, when they reach out, I'm not telling them that they can't do it. Mm-hmm. I'm just painting the picture. I'm just setting expectations. Which that's all we're here to do. That's all we're here to do, man. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I'm giving them the right tools to go execute whatever mm-hmm. it is that they want to execute. Yeah, because they could still, they'll take your advice and yeah. still do it. Yeah, I just want them to know like, now what it's going to look like. Right, now they're <laughs> yeah. more prepared. They'll be like, oh, yeah. this guy, this is coming in hot. This yeah. is getting weird. Jay already told me about this. Yeah. I'm going to pull myself out of the situation. Because yeah. <laughs> dudes, except dudes are weird, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> I love you guys, yeah. but it is what it it's is. It's usually the deltas, too. <laughs> that <are> really <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, right? Yeah. I just want to make sure like this next generation is as prepared as they can be. Women and females. Right? So that's all it is. Speaking of of war and the the way that it changes us, I, I have sometimes difficulty kind of articulating how and why that happens. I don't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, I've almost got shot a few times. Yeah. I've almost shot my own leg off with a three twenty incident. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been like three feet from the enemy, and I don't know how that affects yeah. things. I I just see like like I was saying, I got to call the. Other, uh, from my, one of my teammates is like, oh, I remember this guy from uh, 2-4, he just yeah. hung himself, and it's like, there's been so much suicide. Yeah. And so you know that that thing is lingering there, but I I just don't know if it's something that just pops up randomly on guys or if they've been kind of slowly, quietly dealing with it mm-hmm. or it just comes out of nowhere, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. But... Um, so I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if it just randomly popped up and now I find myself yeah. kind of dealing. Uh, but that being said, let's take an opportunity to talk about maybe a war experience for you mm-hmm. or, or something. Let's let's kind of dig into a little bit of trauma yeah. and something that maybe stuck with you and how it affected you long term or how you kind of coped with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but just there's so much that we don't talk about, but there's so much trauma in this life. Yeah. And from seeing people's blown to pieces to killing people to losing friends, um, we all have a little bit of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So is there any of yours that you would be willing to talk about? Yeah. So my very first one, um, and I think this is where it all started for me, and that's where, that's where I, I, I figured it all out. So I was um, 19. 19 years old, uh, fresh out of basic training. I get to my first duty station, uh, and immediately, two months later, I'm in Iraq, initial invasion, 2003, and I'm conducting uh, route clearance. All right, this was the beginning of the war. Um, IEDs weren't as um, advanced as they later became, uh, but it was still a threat, right? Um, So we were responsible for doing uh, route clearance. So whenever a convoy would come through to go deliver supply because again it's still the uh genesis of the war uh fobs are not a set up so we would have a lot of convoys come through to go deliver supplies so on and so forth so this was around uh the ramadi area so um at that point we had m112s which were uh, just uh regular uh track vehicles there was no up armored or any of that stuff so we got tasked to go clear um an actual route. So the entire platoon goes out. It was, uh, I was the third vehicle in. It was a, a convoy of four. So we're going down this uh, um, route um, and we're going, we're going, and there was a big explosion uh, 
behind my vehicle. I was the second vehicle. Uh, let me correct that. Yeah, so first vehicle, second, uh, third, and fourth. So I was the second vehicle, and I had the 249. I was a, um, a rear gunner, so I was just standing there just uh, pulling security off to the side. So this big explosion goes off, and of course we're all shocked. We don't know what's going on. We're looking around, making sure, because we've gotten hit before. Um, we just started to react how we typically do. So I'm facing the rear, so I, I see the explosion. Um, once the smoke clears, you know, I see the number four vehicle. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, the other one must be behind it, right? So I thought the vehicle that I saw was number three and then four was behind it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh shit, they completely missed, right? When in reality, the entire fucking track was completely gone. Oh. Yeah, so it was 600 pounds of explosive that they had packed on the side of the road because we were going up a slight uh, incline, so they packed it from both sides. So when it went off, it served as like an EF EFP and kind of shot up into the actual track and then blew the entire thing. So, I, so I'm looking back, and I'm like, okay, truck number three is right there. Four must be behind it. So I'm leaning to the side trying to see the fourth truck, and I don't see it. And my gunner, he starts hitting the driver on the head. He's like, go, 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 go. And we looked up, and the engine block was floating towards the troop hatch. Oh. So we he hauled ass, and as soon as we moved, it landed right there. So we're looking at each other like, holy fuck fuck like the entire track is gone right and i'm 19 uh, <laughs> so we all get out we set a perimeter and we all get out and we're looking around and we start seeing you know vehicle parts right and we're walking around and a buddy of mine he came up to me and he was like hey you know private davis he's decapitated I didn't know what that meant, right? Because again, I I just like I didn't know the English vocabulary mm -hmm. like that well. Because I'm a you know I'm from Haiti, like I learned the language. Certain words I just didn't know, mm -hmm. right? So to my ignorance, I'm like decapitated. Like, well, what does that mean? He was like, his head is gone because he was driving. So when it hit, it took his head, and then the uh, track just blew up, and his body was laying um, laying in a ditch. So I go over there and I look at him. I'm like, holy fuck, his entire fucking head is gone. And I remember walking around because at that point we didn't have everything as set up as we did later on in, in the years. So we had um, we we had to cord on the entire area mm -hmm. and we had to start the cleanup process, right? So Davis was the only one intact. Everybody else was just pieces. Right. So and again, uh, my they were my platoon, my dudes that we were, you know, bullshitting with. And I just remember going through and just picking up body parts and putting them in bags. Right. So total, we lost six dudes just from that incident. Right. And again, I'm 19. <laughs> I We finally got a, a platoon to come replace us, an infantry platoon and the entire platoon goes back to the fob and dude for the first I want to say it was a couple of hours it was just silence and I for me like I just remember like not knowing what to think <laughs> like I didn't know what to feel or what to think yeah, I just, just remember because it's like, like what the fuck like I'm I just I went to my room and it was just just quiet all the way around because you don't know what to say to your buddy he doesn't know what to say to you you don't know what just happened, you know what I mean? So wow. we, we all just sat there and we just kind of like numb all the way around, right? Um, and then fast forward the next day, we, we had to go back out and do it all over again, right? Because we have vehicles that are moving through, we gotta go, go clear. Um, so that entire deployment, it was one of those things like we didn't really talk about it, we just kind of did the job. Uh, and then once I got back home, from that deployment, that's where everything started to come to uh, fruition, right? Mm. Um, I was 19 when I got back, I was 20. Um, I was a decent soldier at the time. I got back, dude, everything just unraveled. You can't even buy a beer yet. No. And you've seen six of your friends yep. get exploded. Yeah. 
Yeah, to the point where we had to go pick up body parts. And I wasn't the only one. Like, we were all young. Yeah. Like, I was 20, some of my, like, dude, we are all private, right? In that incident, my lieutenant got killed, the, the team leader got killed, um, and then one of the squad leaders got killed along with the driver and one of the guys. So the entire senior rank just got wiped out. Whew. And now as a private, as a PFC, I'm now a team leader. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because um, since I had some college, I came in as a PFC and everybody else was just privates. So here I am, numb as fuck, you know, just not really know what to think. And now I'm in charge of like two other dudes. All right, dude, it was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so fast forward, we get back from that trip and I just went from being a decent soldier to now I'm just a dirt bag. Like I'm talking about, I'm going down. Um, this was at Fort Riley, Kansas, about 45 minutes away, there's um, Aggieville where K-State is. Mm. So now I'm going down to K-State um, to a bar that was over there and I'm getting in fights. Mm. I'm fighting with football players. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just out of control um, to, the point where, uh, to the point where there was one incident uh, me and my buddy, because at this point, we're all messed up, right? We all come back, we all have the same trauma, and we're all out of control. Mm. Squad leaders can't control us. Like, they don't know what to do with us. And we go out, we get drunk, and we get in fights. That was our way of coping with it mm. at the time. So my buddy and I, were out, um, and we got into this big fight. And the cops come out to, you know, break up the fight. And the cop hemmed up my buddy. You know what I mean? And I'm like, wait a minute, you don't touch him. Like, that's my buddy. We mm -hmm. just went to war together. Like, we've seen things like, get off of him. So I grab the cop, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I pull him off. Next thing, you being a former cop, you know that's a no-no, yep. <laughs> right? Next thing I know, I'm, 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 I'm balled up mm -hmm. against the wall, handcuffs on me, and now I'm in jail, right? Because mm -hmm. felony, putting my hands on a cop. So I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if I... So now I'm in jail. We we had this brand new first son at the time, this no nonsense guy. So I call I call the company. I was like, hey, you know, such and such is in jail. They asked the first son, are oh, you gonna go pick him up? He was like, fuck no, let him stay in there. Cause he knew, you know, the stuff that we had gone through and, mm -hmm. and, and he was trying trying his best to fix us to get us back on the right path. So I spent the night in jail. Um in the morning, he picks me up, and then we, we go back. And at this point, I still have a charge lingering. Um, felony charge, which if it goes through, I can't carry a gun, <laughs> right? And since I'm in combat MOS, I'm getting kicked out of the Army. Oof. Dishonorable discharge, and there goes my life, right? So I'm in the barracks, and I'm just losing my shit. I'm fucking sweating bullets, man. I'm like, fuck. Like... I went in the military so I can do this to improve my life, mm -hmm. to better my family, and here I am, like, I'm in this holding pattern. So, fast forward two or three months later, I go to court, my first offense, I'm a soldier, so they had pity on me, right? They was like, hey, your first offense, this is what we're gonna do. You gotta go to the police station and speak in front of three shifts <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> and tell them what you did and how sorry you are. Oh, no, I and couldn't you, imagine. <laughs> you do that, you're good to go. Um, so I did. I went to three separate shifts. I stood up there. I spoke to them, um, apologized sincerely, and they understood because they've been dealing with soldiers doing mm -hmm. that since the war started. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so they understood everything was forgiven, and then I, I go back to work, and that was the wake up call that I needed mm. to where I had to go get help. Um, because I I realized that if I kept going down that path, it's only gonna get worse, mm -hmm. right? So um, I started uh, getting counseling. So I went to go see uh, the psych and we just started talking through all the shit that me and my buddies went through. Uh, some of us came out okay, some of us didn't, mm -hmm. right? A lot of guys got out and they just, uh, live with it and never really made anything of themselves uh, not to talk bad about those mm -hmm. dudes everyone's experience is different um, but sitting down with somebody talking it out um, and then realizing that hey dude that was the number three track that got hit that could have been my track at mm -hmm. any point in time so the fact that I survived meant that I was meant for something else because that could have easily been me that was dead mm -hmm. so I just Every time I was, you know, like I find myself being down or going down that rabbit hole, I'm, 
I just remind myself like, hey, those dudes are gone, but it's my, this is my opportunity to to honor them by living and by doing something with my life. I love that. And that just stayed with me throughout my entire career, man. So I just, every chance I got, I was taking care of dudes. I was making sure they was good because of those dudes. Because again, that happened my first deployment, you know, my first uh, contract. So that kind of set everything else for mm-hmm. the rest of my life. You know what I mean? It's insane to me that you walked in and got help. Mm-hmm. That is so above and beyond yeah. what most soldiers do. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, I got buddies right now, still yeah. SF, and they're like, they're hurting. Yeah. But I'm it up. took me getting to that point where I'm <laughs> almost losing it all. Yeah. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. And, yeah. and to be honest, that's bad. I mean, you yeah. go getting arrested just for people's perspectives, like, that's that's bad. Yeah. That, I mean, that's yeah. really bad. Yeah. Especially so, in the Army. <laughs> in the Army to yeah. go, you know, get arrested for a felony. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to then pursue SF and to then yeah. come back from that and reach the highest levels. Yeah. I mean, that that's life, dude. Mm-hmm. That's everything. Is like you don't have to have this stellar, perfect no. trajectory. Is you have to learn how to take it on the chin yeah. and say, how do I get come back from this yeah. and redirect? Oh yeah. And I, I remember a, a psychologist telling me once. Um, she's like, "Do you drive fast?" <laughs> and I was Is like, that a "Trick question." I was like. Uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, he gave me scotch. That's right. Yeah, it's all good. He was all drinking good. whiskey. You're trying to be nice, so. It seemed much, it seemed much lighter in color. Oh, no, you're good, <laughs> so man. I thought he was drinking that. Are you good? You're good. I just thought you were fancy, man. <laughs> no, you're good, man. Um, and she said, well, do you drive fast? And I was like, occasionally, yeah, I drive extremely fast, you know, 125 plus. Yeah. I, I'm in a rush. I gotta yeah, get where I want to go. And she said, "Well, uh, it's common with vets is yeah. that you guys will seek out that adrenaline rush, yeah. and you're trying to you're trying to normalize your heightened state mm-hmm. post war by doing things that are deserving of that heightened state. Yeah. So it's almost as when you got back, you your heightened state so, so up here that you had to go find fight. a reason yeah. to yeah. for it to be there. Mm-hmm. And you're like, at least if you're in a fight, that's why you're in a heightened state." Yeah. Because you're you're on guard, you're, you're constantly mm-hmm. even though, but you're seeking that out. Yeah. And so it's crazy to look at these stories and, and see the patterns and the way mm-hmm. we behave after yeah. the fact, yeah. because it's unstable. Yeah, it's unstable. Yeah. As fuck. And man, no one's talking about <laughs> yeah. that, right? Yeah. Like everyone wants to be SF, but yeah. you don't really want all these problems. There's a price. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a price you got to pay, and sometimes it's like again, I'm one of the lucky ones that got. Help I feel the same. In time, um, there's a lot of dudes that you know, never really make it out mm. to where they're back home, uh, they're in drugs, the next thing you know, they take their own lives because they just don't know how to fix that. Mm-hmm. Society doesn't know how to fix that. The VA right. doesn't know how to fix that. Because if figuring they it did, out. we wouldn't have as many suicides as, as we currently are having. Which is insane. It yeah, just keeps it's, happening. Yeah, it's 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 ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've almost gotten shot, and I, I, I feel, you know, and I've had the close calls, mm-hmm. and I feel that tension right because that's its own thing right where you're like like you said that could have been my truck yeah where you're so close that it's hard to swallow that it didn't happen Mm -hmm. it's almost like you wished it did happen happen. to you which is a weird feeling to have Mm -hmm. right because it's like if you're going to shoot a bullet like this instead of leaving me with the rest of my life wondering why i wasn't standing here just hit me yeah and so then, then there's that kind of trauma that you have to deal with yeah but then survivor's guilt almost yeah and then you've also had the kind of trauma that we've shared uh, an incident that to me is worse mm-hmm. because it's self-inflicted. Yeah. So let's talk about that story. Yeah, sure. um, and I think it's important to talk about, first of all, when I got on YouTube and started being on social media, I was so terrified to bring it up. And I was on Andy Stump's podcast yeah. um, the first time I brought it up yeah. and I had a few whiskeys <laughs> and feeling confident and fuck I just, it. fuck it. And I let it ride. <laughs> I let too much ride on that podcast, dude. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> but it ended, and I left there yeah. demoralized. I walked yeah. out of Andy's podcast the first time, and I wanted to cry. Yeah. I wanted to, like, crawl up in a hole and not mm-hmm. come out of it for a week. Yeah. Um, and then once the dust kind of settled mm-hmm. for me, I realized it was, like, the best thing I could have yeah. done was to hit my mistakes head on yeah. because then they were just out in the universe. Mm-hmm. So let's hit one of your yeah. mistakes head on so that way nobody ever has that ammunition yeah. against you. Yeah. And oh, yeah. it's proving that you're – here to help and mm-hmm. the best way we could help is by showing people our mistakes yeah i agree 100 because uh again you and i both know that 
when you get to that level, uh, being a Green Beret, being called an SF guy, like it's like the um, epitome of a soldier, right? Mm-hmm. You're you're doing things at the highest level, mm-hmm. and I think across the entire DoD, anyone that shares that title understands that. Uh, so, for me, not only was I at that high level of being an SF guy, I was also at the highest of level at being a team sergeant. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because um, for folks that don't understand, like the team sergeant in special operation or in uh, SF as a Green Beret, like you're that dude, mm-hmm. right? You are the, the most, guy. yeah, like you yeah. are the most experienced guy on that team. Mm-hmm. The captain is there, but you can have a brand new captain that has no idea. The men don't need him. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like I can lead that team by myself, right? right? I still love all you, my captains that I've had in the past. I don't want to hear any junk from you guys. Yeah. But the team sort is that heavyweight fighter. Mm-hmm. Like he is Mike Tyson, right? The, all the dudes want to be like him. He sets the stage. He sets the standard. So operating at that high of a level means a lot, especially to me, right? Because it took me, um, you know, it took a lot of time and grind for me to get to that point. I had to make a bunch of different moves so I can get to that point of my career. So um, I'm a team sergeant. I have two months left before I'm uh, team sergeant time complete, right? I've already interviewed for a bunch of different first sergeant jobs. So I have, you know, my next move lined up to where I can go be a first sergeant and then go be a sergeant major, so on and so forth. And my team was at Safawik. That was just one of the training that we had laid out leading into another um, um, exercise that we were going to do out of Camp McCall. Right, so with Safawik... <laughs> We're out there having fun, right? Because I, I, I love shooting. Um, yeah, Safawak, if you guys don't know, is a shooting school. Yeah. It's got it's, uh, really, uh, for me, was my first time getting to shoot with my with a, with team, team guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to go with my team because they were yeah. in Africa at the time. Yeah. But I got to go with a team. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So um, my entire team had a chance to go through together, right? We just come back from a deployment. Which is best case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. We just got back from a deployment from uh, a Jordan, so we had seven months of just us bonding and coming together as a team. So really close-knit type uh, uh, group of dudes. So we go to Safawik, um, two months removed from being done with my team sergeant time, and we're, uh, shit, man, we are a week, we have a week left at Safawik. Like, seven weeks, everything mm. was fucking peachy, I'm running and gunning, I'm having fun. Like, I'm having a good old time. Mm. Uh, but that day, like, so much shit was going on with my business, with, you know, uh, the family, with the range. I remember we were doing some breaching uh, 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 charges off to the side um, to where we breach a door, we go in, and we engage targets. And I had a phone call to where I stepped away, and I was on the phone for about 30 minutes to where the iteration was done. Uh, and then the guys went back to the uh, hooch and everybody was um, take, taking all that stuff off because it was time to leave. Mm. So I get off the phone and I go back to the hooch and um, at no point in time did I clear uh, my, 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 my pistol, right? Uh, my long gun, I cleared that. My pistol, I uh, wasn't cleared. And I, you know, went to take my gun out. It was one of those weird fucking holsters. Um, and a round went off, right? I'm talking about I'm in a uh, container with all of my dudes, Mm. right? Round goes off. And you can just... Loud as shit. Dude, you can just see the look on everybody's face, right? And I'm talking about round goes off, and I I, I just... I knew what it just took Mm -hmm. place. And when you're talking about defeat, first thing we did, everybody looked around, Budweiser, make sure fucking nobody's hurt, right? Um... We find my fucking hole, make sure we knew where the round went. Um, and then once that was done, we all go outside and everybody just took a fucking moment, right? Um, and I've never felt so defeated in my entire fucking life. Mm. When I say just probably the worst feeling I've ever had in my life because not only, yeah, it, it took me 16 fucking years, right, of handling guns and all of that mm-hmm. shit for it to happen. But, dude, when it happened, not only did I feel defeated, I felt as if I had let my entire team mm-hmm. down, right? Because when that took place, dude, I knew what I had to do, but that didn't make it any easier. Mm-hmm. Um, credit to my team, like, we were so close-knit, we were the only ones around 
to where uh, everybody within the team, uh, which till this day, like I would always appreciate what they try to do. We all came together and it was like, hey, Jay, check it out. Like instructors don't know what just took place. This is between us as a team. Like there's no need to ever talk about this. And that I appreciated. Mm -hmm. But as a leader um, of them, I knew that that wasn't the right answer because everybody that comes to the team, I counseled them on what was gonna happen if something like that ever took place. Mm. So to now change things up because it's me wasn't right. And I know I, wasn't, I wouldn't be able to live with myself, right? So even though they're all trying to protect me because they knew what was gonna happen, right? Um, I, I, I told them like, hey, I appreciate it. However, if this was one of you guys, you all you guys know that I would have fired you regardless of what was going on mm. so I cannot then turn around and let myself get off the hook with it right so I found my fox I was like hey man this is your team now you lead them in I'm gonna go call some major I'm gonna let them know what took place I'm stepping down right um emotional as fuck mm -hmm. right because again I've never cried or got terrorized but I did that day because mm -hmm. that was my team. Those were my dudes, man. Like, I literally built that team from scratch because it was a younger team, so I had a chance to put a lot of my experience and my influence on them. Um, so, yeah, very emotional movement. Um, got a hold of the song major. I was like, hey, this is what just took place. Um, well, first I got a hold of the Safal constructors and told them, hey, this is what just took place. ND over there. Safal so dudes were like, hey, like you can finish the course if you want to. I was like, no, because I can't be around my dudes and not lead them mm -hmm. right so i'm good i'm gonna remove myself from the course and then i called my soul major i was like hey this just took place um i put the fox in charge i took myself off the team mainly because that's one of the policies that we have within the team um and yeah everything else kind of worked out man but i think and a lot of the guys pulled me off to the side and they told me it was like hey like the fact that you did this um make us respect you a lot mm -hmm. more because they've been around leaders that had those experiences and try to cover them as if they never happened and they try to push, sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually everything worked out once I left um, the team and I left the company. Just the fact that I was so honest and I owned it, um, the folks that I had interviewed with for those first on gigs, they still put me in those positions and I was still on the right track to making the, the uh, next rank. Nice. But that accountability aspect of it played a lot as opposed to me trying to sweep it under the rug and then let day later on find out. Right. And then my entire team would have been in trouble. Right. Know? For trying so, to cover it. Yeah. Which has happened before in oh, SF. Yeah. That oh, yeah. all the time. A funny thing because mm -hmm. immediately after my incident, a week later, another uh, team <laughs> has a similar incident mm -hmm. and then the leaders on that team try covering it up and then they found out about it. And they get yeah uh, it was a shit show <laughs> yeah it was a fucking shit show you know what i mean so i was like you know what we had a guy in my company yeah. shot himself in the hand uh word is uh, a pretty popular influencer <laughs> from 10th group shot himself in the foot oh um haven't heard that one was on a video game yeah <laughs> you know what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, word is he shot himself in the foot at yeah. an unauthorized range. Yeah. Um, but then that's not to talk shit about him. I mean, yep. we're, it stupid shit happens. I yeah. I had the three twenty attached to my hip, mm -hmm. was getting pulled up a wall, and it, in mine, was one hundred percent my fault because yeah. I put the uh, five fifty cord strap to hold the the three twenty to my side. Mm -hmm. I put it through the trigger guard. Yeah. And my senior came up to me. He goes, "Hey, man, you running that with that through the trigger guard?" And I was like, yeah, but I'm not running around in it. And he was like, all right, it's your your call. <laughs> and we go to get in contact. I put a round in it. I go to shoot. And one of the CAA guys was like, hey, come up here. I got a better spot. So I hooked it back up. I put it on safe. He's pulling me up this wall because there's no ladder to get to one of these huts in Afghanistan. Yeah. And as he's pulling me up, it slides it off safe because the selector switch on the 320 mm -hmm. is pushed down. And it pulls the cord somehow i mean i'm all my kid on it's like yeah. pulling the cord and it it's got a clip on it so it's easy it caught the clip and just pulled it as, poof, and i was like what the fuck <laughs> get on top of the yeah. the 
see the roof and with the guy and he just looks at me the calmest look on his face he goes your gun went off <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> oh god <laughs> like not for the fact that I almost shot myself in the leg yeah. but like you said I'm a green beret yeah. I'm finally getting green beret combat yeah. and I shoot a fucking ND yeah. with a 320 with a uh, CIA guy standing below me oh, shit. so I could have killed him yeah. Oh, yeah. I could have killed myself mm-hmm. hit myself in an uh, artery I could have killed him Luckily, the arming distance. Yeah. But it's like, it's the worst feeling it, on the dude, planet. It, it was fucking horrible. Horrible. Um, but a, a really close buddy of mine mentioned, he was like, dude, you, you handle guns enough, then it might happen. Mm-hmm. You just need to understand that. Uh, and when it does, again, just just stick to your your, your values mm-hmm. and your characters and, and practice ownership and accountability. And that'll... It doesn't make it right, mm-hmm. but the fact that you are publicly talking about it, it lets people know that you're human. You're human, yep. and if it happens to them, that this is the right way to handle it. Right, right, and that goes a long way. Yeah, I had uh, another incident. My yeah. my team sergeant, he was a team sergeant just for a little bit, but he was going to the CRIF, and mm-hmm. so the CRIF sent him to uh, what was it Sephardic? Yeah, and he had an Indian Sephardic. Got kicked out of Sephardic, went back and graduated. Yeah. It's like, hey, dude, that's really embarrassing. You're a team sergeant, you, yeah. indeed, but you got over it. Yeah. yeah. You took your, you took it on the chin, got mm-hmm. kicked out of the course, said, you know what, I'm sticking to my goal of getting on the criff, yeah. went back and knocked it out. And it's like, who could be mad at that? No, nobody. Nobody. Yeah, as opposed to lying about it. Right. And not only do you have to live with that for the rest of your life, every time you look in the mirror, it, other people might not know, but you're going to know. Mm-hmm. And that's a good way to just destroy your confidence and your fucking character mm-hmm. and who you actually stand for, right? Put all your mistakes yeah. right out on your sleeve. <laughs> Fuck it. And just yeah. own it yeah. and, and walk away. It's the hardest thing, mm-hmm. but it's so freeing. Yeah. Because yeah, then is. nobody can come and be like, I have this on you. Yeah, exactly. And it's exactly. like, no, you don't. I already talked about that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and people tried when I first started the channel. Yeah. They'd be like, oh, oh, Buck, he got kicked off his team. And I was like, well, I already told everybody about yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. Em. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. <laughs> I was very open about that yeah. in the podcast. I came out a month before yeah. you were trying to say that. Yeah. It's like, I wear my mistakes on my sleeve. Yeah. And we have to let people know that we're human. We mm-hmm. make mistakes, but we're trying. And that's yeah. that's all they could do. It's all we could do. And if you are trying, you're one of the few that are working towards a better future yeah. because there's so many people that gave up on trying. They don't oh, yeah. try anymore. No. No. They, they accept it. They're just comfortable it. being mediocre. Yeah. yeah. So. So. All right, man. Well, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, definitely. This is a great conversation. Um, is there anything – this is probably a good chance for you to outro, like mm-hmm. where you're going, what your goal is for yeah. the channel, um, where people could find you on your – what's your Instagram and all okay. that stuff so people could check you out. I gotcha, gotcha. But, yeah, man, I appreciate you having me. Again, guys, Greenberry Chronicles. Uh, again, the intent there is to share – 20 plus years of knowledge and wisdom with the next generation uh i do a lot of uh prep course stuff on there i also do a lot of motivational stuff on the channel um i was doing a lot of fitness stuff on there but i'm like hey uh if you're a man you should figure out how to go work out right you don't need to just watch me work out and then uh, learn from me uh but yeah i do uh mainly sf guy stuff on there if you're interested in being a green beret um if you're interested in being a better man a better father uh, check me out, Greenberry Chronicles, uh, Greenberry Chronicles on Instagram also. Uh, and just just reach out, man. I also started doing the uh, Sergeant's Time Mentorship Program. Um, and that's not necessarily SF-oriented. If a soldier is out there having issues, whether it's a private, just get on there, give me a call, and I'll get on the phone with you, and I'll okay. iron it out, right? Because I have 20 years of experience not only in um, SF, but also in the military. Mm. So I can get on the phone and talk you through whatever it is that you're going through. If I don't have that knowledge, best believe I have friends over the span of my 20 years uh, that do, and I'll be able to get you uh, an answer to whatever it is that that you're actually going through. Uh, But yeah, uh, come over and say what's up. It's it's an awesome channel, and I'm just looking forward to serving uh, this generation, right? Because I'm invested in it. Um, I know you also, mm-hmm. and 
all we want to do is just make you better so you can achieve your goal in your end state, right? Absolutely. So again, man, I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, man. Dude, it's crazy because we didn't even have access to that Fuck much no. experience like no. <laughs> in the in yeah. SF. Yeah. Like as the new guy, like yeah. you're not gonna go talk to the team sergeant no. about goals and mentorship and guidance. No. He's gonna be like, get the fuck away from me. Then you just gotta figure it out. Yeah, right? figure it out. Yeah. Go sweep floors, clean the bathrooms, yeah. and and you'll figure it out as you go. But yeah. he's not gonna take his time to mentor yeah. and coach you. So yeah. they they don't. It's almost hard for people to understand how high up yeah. they're going in the food chain to get mentored mm -hmm. for pennies to nothing yeah. for what they're getting it's yeah. insane like yeah. as green berets new guys yeah. we weren't getting this level of mentorship yeah so thanks man i really appreciate it you're doing Definitely. amazing stuff um and i truly believe and that's why you're here sitting yeah. across from us is because we truly believe that your heart's in the right place Definitely. and that you're that your name is going to continue to rise yeah. and we're glad to be associated with you so that's awesome, appreciate man. it man. i appreciate it that means a lot hell yeah bro yeah that was a good one we're done i gotta go pee man Can i, go yeah, pee? I gotta go pee <laughs> <laughs> we out let's go ahead and turn the audio boxes off